mercy and peace to you. I hope this video finds you well, and I hope that what we are offering in these days in a new way of praying together wherever we are, that we're calling cruciform, I hope this is helpful for you. This is a, a new um, approach to daily prayer that we've created for this time and this moment when life and things like coronavirus keep us from all being in the same place together, maybe because sometimes it feels so chaotic with so many things constantly changing that it might be helpful to have a regular way of praying that, that doesn't feel just like reciting memorized things, but also gives structure to what can feel like chaotic times these days. I don't know about you, but I have noticed that it feels too, not just like there's a lot of chaos, but there's a lot of division and polarization among us today. And that part of what our witness as followers of Jesus needs to look like in this time is that we can be people who pray both for those who are close to us, who we love and hold dear and who are very important to us, but also that we're called, especially in a moment and in a time like this, to be prayerful for those that we see as our enemies or those we are opposed to, those we struggle the most to love. That's at the heart of Jesus' message, and at the heart of what the good news is all about, because in the end the gospel is about God's love for us even while we were enemies. How much more then does God love us and hold on to us as God's love has turned us and brought us into Christ? So I want to invite you, we want to invite you these days, if it's helpful for you, to pray alongside us with this new approach we're calling cruciform. Cruciform is just a fancy word that means cross-shaped. And that name shows up for a couple of reasons. One, what you're going to see as this series goes on is that there are intentional moments with different focus in each point for us to pray for, to, to make sure we, we are turning our hearts and our minds in prayer to different areas of our lives and of the world. And so because of the way those points are aligned, for our purposes, they're kind of cross-shaped. But more to the point, I think we're, we're interested in this time in seeking that God would make us more Christ-like, that God would shape each of us to be more like Christ. And that's going to mean that we become people whose lives and whose love look cross-shaped. In other words, people whose lives are marked by the self-giving love Jesus showed us and to all people at the cross. So I, I want to walk you through this. This is, like I say, a, a brand new invention. And most of the pieces of this order of prayer are ancient, but this way of praying together is something that we've created for this time and place. So I want to walk you through it. What happens in it, how you might do this on your own. If you want to join in with the Monday through Friday videos we're going to be sharing, you're welcome to. But if you get the concept, you're welcome to spin this off on your own, to pray on your own. You can use candles of your own. You can do it without candles. You can use that sort of mental picture of the five-pointed cross, or you can um, feel free to, to use the actual visuals of the candles we'll be using in the videos. But I want to walk through each point, the what it is and the why it is at each point along the way. Um, if you watch each of the videos that we're going to be offering, you'll notice that they always begin with centering in the cross. And the, the very, very center of the cross is the candle that turns our focus onto God and onto who God is. So, after lighting the first candle, again, whether you're just borrowing the light we use in our videos or whether you're going to be uh, lighting your own candles, the focus at this point is to, to pray and to be mindful on who God is. What, what, what's God like? Why is it that we're gathered to worship this particular God? And so we start with prayer that calls on, that retells the stories of what God has done for, uh, for God's people in the story of Israel and in the life, of the, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus and the spirits gathering us together in this new community called church. And then there's a, a reading from one of the Psalms. The Psalms themselves are our prayers, our, our ancient songs or poems that people have, have prayed and have, have used for their own prayer life for literally thousands of years. And one of the things I hope you'll discover along the way, if you've never had the chance in your lifetime to pray through the Psalms, is that you discover they run the whole gamut of human experience from joyful celebration to, to sharp, harsh 
anger and bitterness to deep heartbreak and sadness, and sometimes all of those at once over the course of one song or one poem. And yet these psalms also point us to God, who God is. Why is it that we call on this ancient God, the God of Abraham and Sarah, the God of Miriam and Moses, the one we call on as the Lord, Yahweh, who Christians believe is also revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And these psalms, you'll discover over time, say things, show things about who God is, honestly. They show us God's mercy and God's care for those who are stepped on, God's justice and God's truthfulness, the way that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, the way God is majestic and also nearer than our own breath, present even in stillness, and also in the roar of thunder and the power of an earthquake. So the, the first movement in this prayer series centers us in God, with the opening prayer that begins, Blessed are you, our God, and then one of the Psalms. And then from there, you're invited, uh, again, whether you're lighting your own candle or you're uh, watching the video, to light the candle that's farthest from you. So since I'm the one lighting candles here, this one that's farthest from me. As a reminder that we're called not just to pray for ourselves individually, it's not just about me and God, but that I find my place as a part of God's bigger, wider world. And so, we're invited to do two things in this moment. One is to pray the words that we often use in our regular public worship life. They may be part of your individual devotional life already that we call the Lord's Prayer. These are uh, words that are a, a pattern, a template that we're given to pray uh, from Jesus. And this is not meant to be a script of the only way you can pray, but it's a way to ground our prayer in praying for God's will, God's reign to happen in all places. And so I find my place in the collective we of praying our Father, that's plural, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and we pray, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses. Those aren't just prayers for me and my immediate family, or me and my town, me and my political party, me and my country, but for all people everywhere, the well-behaved and the stinkers as well, Jesus points out. And then I find my place within that. So, after we pray those words we call the Lord's Prayer, then you're invited on your own to pray for a particular need that you can think of in, in the world. It may be something far, far away, half a world away across an ocean. It may be right in your own neighborhood. But to, to be concrete, to be thinking, it, it may come from what you've paid attention to on the news that morning. Karl Barth used to say we ought to do our lives in Christ with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And maybe that's how we ought to pray as well, being mindful of the needs around us in the world and bringing those to God. And then to pray that God would use us in addressing that need somewhere in the world. It's up to God how God answers that, but that's the invitation, that maybe we too might be a part of the answer to the prayer. Then we move to the third part of our cruciform approach, and that's to light the candle closest to us, because this is now the moment for me, for me to bring who I am. And certainly, you and I are already probably pretty good at telling God the things we want God to do for us. Dear God, please help me make uh, the rent payment. Dear God, please give me a good day. Help me find a parking place. Please uh, help me find the right words to forgive somebody. We're, we're good at those things already. But maybe what we need are things to remind us who's we are. So in this third moment, there's going to be a, a cycle of readings. There's going to be ten different readings that will cycle through on a two-week basis. Because as we do cruciform, it's going to be um, Monday through Friday, so five days in a week, with a two-week uh, rotation. So ten different readings that are all from the New Testament, because we'll be hearing from the Psalms earlier, that I've chosen as ways of anchoring us in who we are as the people of God and who we are as the followers of Jesus. There's lots of always background noise in the wide world telling us what other things, other voices want us to be or who we are, but we keep coming back to the scripture amidst all the noise going around so that we're clear on who and whose we are. And that who and whose we are has a lot to do with grace and a lot to do with God's commitment to love, not just well-behaved people, but even enemies as well, and that that forms us also. 
Then there's another prayer that lifts up all we are and asking God to use us to be agents of resurrection. And also, one of the things that I think is difficult sometimes in our life of faith is to pray that God would not just change things out there where I can see and see God fix that person, fix that person, that, that problem, but to turn inside us. So you'll see this moment of our prayer service turns toward asking God to deal with the hatred or the division or the unsettledness or the bitterness inside each of us. Then we move to the fourth part of our cruciform daily prayer. And this is, again, um, because of where I'm sitting, the candle that's to your left is the one that's going to be lit. And this is intended to be a prayer for someone you care about, someone you know. Imagine praying for a family or for friends, someone who's close, near and dear to you. Again, that will probably be pretty easy. We find it easier to pray for people we already know or care about. And in that moment, we're asking you not just to pray for them, but then to take the additional step of, on the same day, you offer prayer to write to that person. Write a card or a note. And in this day and age, you can be an email or a text message, too. But, wow, there's something so very powerful about the written word that you put in the mail and it actually gets delivered to somebody that says, I took the time, <laughs> I thought it out, I thought in complete sentences, and you're important. To me. It's again, we're trying to make the connection between that prayer isn't just me and God and then I forget, but I pray and then also God uses me in part of the answer of that prayer. So as I'm praying for needs going on in somebody else's life, I'm also thinking, God, help me to know what can I say to brighten this person's day, to lift them up, to speak grace, or to, to connect with that person. And then that moves us to the last step which is in some ways the hardest, but I think the most important, because it is difficult. And that's for us to do what Jesus teaches us to do, and to pray for our enemy. To pray for someone you struggle with, to pray for somebody that you ne don't necessarily get along with, or maybe have a, 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 an estranged or strained relationship with. That's difficult. And it's difficult to even know what does it mean to pray for our enemies, or to pray for those who we don't get along with. Because in a world like ours that sees everything, it seems, in terms of competition about who, who wins or loses. If I pray something good for somebody else, that means I lose. That's not really what it's about. It's not even praying for people that you don't like to succeed in doing wicked or bad or rotten things. But it's more about asking that God's reign, God's will, God's goodness would get a hold of all of us. And the people who I don't like, the people I struggle with, that where they're off track, that God would turn them, and where I'm off track, that God would work on me, and together that God would work on all of us, bringing us together into the love that God uses to reign over all creation. So there you've got it, the, the sign of the cross in candlelight and in how we pray. God at the center. God's beloved world even far away from me, back to me as the candle closest to me, for friends and for those we struggle with. And then our, the end of our order is a setting of what's uh, sometimes called Simeon's song, or the Nunc Dimittis, if you speak Latin. It's this, a song that's often used in church prayer liturgies um, at the ending of our service times. These ancient words are the words that um, uh, Luke, uh, when he's giving us the story of Simeon meeting the child Jesus, says, Now, Lord, you're letting your servant go in peace. Those words in our corporate worship life are words we use then before we're sent out into the world. And here we're going to be using a setting of that. Whether you read them out of your Bible, that's fine. Or uh, join in the version, the sung musical version that's set uh, to music uh, that will be on the screen as part of our daily videos. Um, you're welcome to, to join in that. But it's a way of sort of ending this moment and then moving on to the rest of your day. And the invitation is that you pick a time, try and be consistent, that's helpful, but pick a time every day if you're going to join us on this journey to pray. Again, it will take about 10 to 12 minutes. It's not that long, but enough to maybe recharge your batteries, maybe fill your sails again. And whether it's the beginning of the day as you head out into the day or at the end of the day as you unload all that you've been carrying and then head out into the world, we hope this is a useful tool for you in your prayer life. We know this isn't about impressing God. It's not that God is wowed if you keep up at praying every day, or that God answers your prayer if you ask a certain number of times or with a certain number of candles. 
But sometimes we need the structure, sometimes we need these patterns as ways that God's Spirit then works to shape us. And our hope in these days is that God shapes you and me and all of us into the self-given, cross-shaped, cruciform love of Jesus. Blessings to you and to those you love and even to those you struggle with in these days. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.